Seth is Seth is the lead artisan blacksmith and creator uh, at Red Pig Garden Tools. He took ownership of the business in 2017 after two years of hands-on training from his friend and mentor, Bob Denman, who founded the company in 1989. Seth has personally made more than 10,000 hand-forged tools and loves the ongoing opportunities to learn what the hardworking life of an artisan provides. Seth has offered uh, the Master Gardener Foundation of Clark County members and tonight's audience um, a free shipping discount in combination with a free local delivery date that is scheduled for Saturday, October 30th at the 78th Street Heritage Farm parking lot. Um, if you would like to pre-order any tools prior to um, October 19th, the coupon code is MGFCC21. You can find the link. It is redpigtools, all one word, dot com. And I am happy to welcome Seth Pauly this evening. Thank you, Kathy. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me say thanks to Janice and John and Erica, too. And I probably owe thanks to some others for helping make this happen. So thank you, everybody. I'm happy to be here. I'm coming to you from my uh, informal home workshop tonight. My daughter's kicked me out of the house so she can do violin, um, but that's okay. I spend a lot of time here. I love it. I'm very happy in here. And I'm going to be running some slides. There's lots of pictures. Please do uh, use the chat for the questions to Erica. Erica will pass them on. Um, if I miss something, she'll let me know. And I'm happy to stick around a little bit at the end to uh, answer some questions if there's anything that has been unanswered. With that in mind, I'm going to see if I can get this going. Okay, so the tonight's kind of topic, I guess you'd call it, is, is the story of garden tools and their use. I'm not going to go in real deep into, into the entire history of every garden tool. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about tools in general and tools over time and um, our background as a company. Um, if you, you know, talk a little bit about um, how, how, to, how we've gotten to where we are today with the tools we make. And of course, my tools are historic for the most part. We don't invent a lot, although there are over 200 tools that I make and hundreds of custom tools over the years and other, other custom metal work. Um, you know, you'll, I hope you'll see the evolution through this story. I did study history. I did study writing. I love telling stories. I love talking. So uh, excuse any, any digressions that happen due to a story being told. Um, I think it should be fun. Um, and uh, like I said, at the end, after we've kind of moved past the, the story session, which will be a little bit, which will be the longer session, um, I'm going to leave you with some practical tips about choosing a tool and things you should know about using tools. Um, hopefully that'll leave you with the ability to, to, to choose the right tool when you're doing your work, but also to know how to use it and to identify um, a good tool when you see them, whether it's one of mine, whether it's one you've discovered in some garage at a garage sale, whether you see it at the store. That is the goal. And um, if after this, you do have any other questions or something that don't, it doesn't get answered, you're more than welcome to, to email me or use the website, redpigtools.com and send me some, send me a message through that and I'll be happy to respond via email or, or a phone call. All right. Okay. So I always like to start by uh, giving acknowledgement to and thanking my mentor, Bob. This is me and Bob about probably five years ago now. I can't remember exactly what year that was at, at the Spring Garden Fair in, in Canby um at one of the table with a bunch of the tools you make and i met bob at that fair a few years before then walking around seeing some tools talking with them and um i stopped in and, and i had an idea for a variety of tools i wanted to make and or actually at the time i didn't know how to blacksmith so i was assuming he would make them for me and he told me at that point that he was getting ready to start to to wind things down a little bit but he'd be happy to teach me so as long as the, the caveat was I had to spend a little time up front uh, proving that I really wanted to do it. So I did took, take a blacksmithing class and did some practice and did a bunch of reading. And then I showed up at his barn uh, where we used to have a shop out there on his property in Boring. And for the next three or four months, he taught me the basics of tool making and blacksmithing. And at about that time, I realized, why should I be learning this to just make a few tools for myself? And when here's a guy who had immense knowledge and he and I had a lot in common and it seemed like it might make sense uh, for me to continue down his path and build upon what he had already started here. And that's what I try and do. I love doing it. I still talk to Bob regularly 
And uh, we have a great relationship. He's still got a little shop out in Boring. He's not making red pig tools, but he is doing other blacksmithing. Um, and he continues to be a great mentor and friend. And, and I, hope, I hope and wish that most people uh, would have the opportunity to, to meet a friend and meet a mentor, um, like I have had the experience of meeting Bob and spending time with him over these last several years. Let's see here. There we go. This was, this was me uh, about after about a year and a half in, in his shop, learning uh, the basics of, of blacksmithing in his shop. I don't have such an idyllic barn, although my spot is a little bit warmer and a little less sturdy because uh, his, his had a great uh, floor. Having said that, you know, in this shop is where I learned to make, in that shop from this picture, where I learned to make over 150 different garden tools. I learned the basics of design. I developed my skills as a blacksmith um, under a fair amount of tutelage and oversight, and then lots of hours of practice. I mean, I'm telling you, lots of hours of practice. About three months in, I hit a hand, I hit the, I hit a piece of metal. I'd been spending maybe eight to ten hours a week forging for three months, and I thought eh, I kind of got this down. I, I, I can hit the hammer. I, I'm make, moving metal the way I thought it was. Three months in, I hit one one strike, and it felt different than anything before. And then it didn't come back again for another half hour and it happened again and it started to happen more and more regularly until uh, eventually it became second nature. I no longer think about it. In fact, now the only time I consciously think when I'm hammering or doing something is usually if I've just made a mistake um, and it just feels wrong. Um, when we make tools, we do use, you can see really old traditional techniques. We do use propane instead of coal. Coal is a little dirty, hard to get. Propane is much more efficient, but most of the tools you make still make primarily with a hammer and an anvil and a propane forge. It's done by, by hand. It takes about four years to develop the coordination, the skills to make these tools consistently for four years of full-time work. I do have two assistants right now who've been with me for, one's brand new. Um, he's only been with me for five weeks. He's learning quickly. And another, another one has been with me for about four and a half months working part-time. And they're getting to the point now where they can they can start to do some of the work that gets hidden inside the handle. In other words, taking a round rod, hammering it so it's e fairly evenly square so that we can drill through it. Um, every all the materials I use, um, in addition to this, you know, the making them here and now in my home workshop on the north side of Lake Oswego, um, everything is I try to source from from America. I buy from American local American suppliers. I have a buddy who has a plasma cutter who helps me cut out certain shapes when I need it. I buy my, my rivets are sourced from an American company. My handles are custom turned for me down in Arkansas and in Tennessee. Um, it's a great experience that I have with this little network of, of people and small factories. Um, I really enjoy it. And I like to share that with other people and bring it, bring it to the world. Um, you know, in addition to, um, to sort of enjoying the craft of blacksmithing and tool design at this point. Um, I also like to tell the stories and I, this, this image is really meant to show you that, you know, every tool is, is sort of handmade. It's got its own unique story. It is, it has uh, something to tell us. And I like to share those. So if you ever see me at an event, if you ever come by my place, ideally with an appointment so that, you know, I'm here, um, I'm happy to share stories and tell you stories about tools and I can probably go on longer than you'd want me to. So I try to, uh, I'll try to restrain myself. Um, the tools we make can be taken care of. If you take care of them, they'll last you very likely your entire life. There needs to be some maintenance here and there. Uh, recently I replaced a handle on a tool that Bob had made 25 years ago. That was, uh, doesn't happen very often, but that was kind of a fun experience to see an old iteration of a common trowel. And I also got to see a custom made trowel that he had made um, when he lived down in California in the early 1990s that the customers had had worn away and loved. They'd bought, and bought five, lost four of them. They had one left, so they just had me make four more of them. It's really fun to kind of match up this history to the tools. And, and uh, I'm very excited to have them have that and to continue this tradition. Um, this, you know, when we speak of forged tools, you'll see that a lot. You'll see forged garden tools, forged tools, forged, you know, whatever. And it's kind of important to understand there. It's a little bit like uh, organic or hat or free range. There's a definition and then there's a marketing definition. Um, and a lot of people say that tools are forged. Sometimes that means that's accurate. Sometimes not. When I talk about forged tools and hand forged tools, I'm talking about heating up the metal in my forge to around 1900 to 2100 degrees, um, hammering it into shape, reshaping it, bending it, 
um, doing whatever I need to do at the end, quenching it. Then I clean it off, clean off the mill scale, which is impurities that rise up. Um, and then uh, sharpen it, put handles on it, drill, drill through if it needs rivet. In this case, this tool is the beginning of a BlackBerry hoe. Um, and there I'm working on getting ready to split the tines in the back. Um, so that's what I mean. You'll see definitions of forged tools. Some you, There are, let's call them mass produced forged tools. Typically uh, there's a large die and there is a furnace and, the, and a piece of uh, steel is cut roughly to shape. Uh, and then a uh, worker grabs it in some tongs, puts it inside the furnace, gets it hot, takes it out, puts it under the die, presses a button or steps on a pedal. The die closes down, boom, the tool's done. They take it out and it goes through similar practice. Those are also typically strong. So if you see a forged tool, a tool that says it's forged on it, um, typically that's going to be a stronger tool than average. Um, you know, tools will also, most tools today, uh, You've got to watch what you're doing. I, I see good brands of garden tools that had always been forged in the past. Some of them hand forged, always manufactured forged. Um, still saying that they're forged tool companies, but the tools are no longer forged when you read the fine print. When that happens, typically what they've done is they found a really, uh, usually if it's a good brand, they found a quality metal and they found, they've created some dyes in a press and they're cold pressing these. And so they never received the heat um, until perhaps they go into an oven for some heat treatment to kind to harden them appropriately. They're typically thinner. Um, they're typically still good lightweight tools. They're just not, um, they're not gonna be quite as strong. Uh, and then the, the cheapest tools you see, of course they'll be made out of plastic handles, partially plastic. They'll be made out of very thin gauge material. Um, often they have just been uh, quickly welded together and cold bent under pressure. So no heat, no real treatment nothing out there. Those are just fine. There's a place for every type of tool and there's advantages to every type of tool. If you want a hard working, long lasting lifetime tool, something that's not disposable, you really do need to be looking in the forged category as much as you can. Um, you know, I suppose you could say for hundreds of years, I can't tell you exactly uh, when, when forged metal tools sort of took over world history, at least European history, and, uh, and in other places. But I can tell you that because early on, even in the Roman era, although they made metal tools, a lot of tools were made out of wood. Um, but we have to have a thousand years probably worth of, of metal tool, tool making. And of course, before that there were swords, there was a whole variety of things, but metal was a reasonably rare resource and reasonably expensive. So historically, uh, a, an average person didn't have many metal tools. Um, Let's see here. This is an example of my little forge right here. I can make four or 5,000 tools a year out of that thing. Uh, I can easily make 20 to 30 tools. If I work kind of get a good day, good day, and I can probably make 80 to 100, depending on the tool. Um, and the process is to cut metal and stick it in that forge and raise up the heat and let it reach this kind of orange, uh, an orangish to a, to a yellow color. Don't let it get white. Uh, the forge can get hot enough. It can get up to around 2,300 degrees, which is at the point where um, most of the steel that I use will start to burn. Um, and, and we don't want that to happen. So we have to watch it. We stick it in. I'm often working on three to eight tools at a time um, in there. And that allows me to take one out, work on it, put it back in, grab the next one, and just kind of work at a real uh, effective pace. Um, I find after the first five minutes of every day, I, I can hammer for about six or seven hours without noticing much of a difference. Uh, then I start to tire out. Early on, that first five minutes, my hands could barely hold the hammer anymore. So it is something that, that takes a lot of endurance. My assistant who's been with me for now for, for closer to six months, he can go for about 45 minutes before he starts losing steam. Um, so it'll be a while longer for him, but he's getting there and uh, I'm optimistic that that he'll eventually learn the craft the way I want him to learn it so that he can produce the quality that I want to do. I do still check every tool and every part. Um, although, and, and in fact, every single tool, I do about 85% of the work still um, until they can, until he's developed the skills, until they've developed, my assistants have developed the skills to make a great tool. I just can't risk it because I really do believe in producing only the top quality tools, uh, much the way that my mentor Bob did. Um, you know, so the, to continue on with this idea of the process, a forge tool, a piece will go in there. I often forge like a trowel shank and then have a blade, and then I'll use 
what's called oxygen acetylene welding, which is an older style of welding. And I'll weld the two together and get them back in the forge and then hit them. There's a technique called forge welding, which I could use where I would uh, be connecting the metal only in the forge heat. However, you know, I want reliability and consistency. Um, and I know an oxygen acetylene weld will make sure everything is, is top quality and you're not, a blade's not gonna come off accidentally. There's not gonna be an impurity that causes a, a weakness. So I work on it, I'll bring it out and eventually I'll dunk it in water. That's the tools there that you see lying on the ground. Those have all been dunked into water to um, quickly cool them. A lot, most of the steel I use is mild steel. It won't, cooling it quickly doesn't have a great impact. However, it does have enough of an impact. Uh, it probably, you know, at the very surface level, uh, blacksmiths traditionally will report that it does something. If you look scientifically, the evidence is that it doesn't do a whole lot. We'll leave that out to uh, practice versus theory. I don't, I don't know the answer, but what I do know is that the tools hold up immensely well. Um, let's see here. The easiest way to sort of think about what happens when you're working with metal like this and when you're hot forging something versus these other methods I've talked about, cold pressing, um, drop forging, or just cutting out and bending, um, cold bending, is that the metal, the steel becomes much like clay, if you can imagine how clay works. So every time I hit it, it, it feels like a thump. Uh, it feels like I'm hitting something, something like clay, something soft. It absorbs the energy. We have to work quickly while it's still hot because the anvil, uh, my anvil is a little over 200 pounds, um, quickly, of, of, and it's a steel anvil from Sweden, quickly pulls the heat out of the tool. Once we get to probably 600 to 500 degrees, still burn us if we touch the tool, touch the uh, metal, um, but it's no longer really effective to keep working the tool. So that happens, stick it back in the forge and reheat it up to a suitable heat and then continue the work. Um, so what, what does happen though, that that allows when the metal's hot, it's kind of, you know, in going into this, it's not a liquid form, it's not a plasma form, it's a, it's a malleable solid, um, but it does let the sort of the molecules rearrange themselves in there, which is one of the reasons why forged tools end up being strong. You can pack them, you pack down, you pack everything when you're working it with the hammer. Um, you're not introducing little micro cracks or fissures, things like this, which are, you know, characteristics of what happens when something cold gets bent. Um, you can kind of think of it again, if we use the clay analogy, when clay is wet, uh, it is soft, it can be molded. When it gets really dry, it becomes much more brittle and hard. If it gets baked, it gets harder and more durable, but if you drop it, it can still crack. Metal, high, very high carbon steels can crack. You can drop them if they get cold too quickly and they will just shatter. It's happened to me once uh, accidentally when I didn't realize I was working with a piece of high carbon steel um, on a particular project. But in general, um, you know, there's a range of consistencies and, and uh, strengths. When you're cold bending something, you're typically making little tiny micro tears or fissures inside the metal structure. And although in many cases, it's not going to be a big problem or introduce an enormous weakness, it is introducing lots of small weaknesses. Um, so that's one reason why a forge tool is going to generally be stronger and better overall uh, for your long-term performance um, as, a, as a user. I, Yvonne Chouinard, who's the founder of Patagonia, uh, I bring him up right now because Patagonia started as a company, Yvonne Chouinard was opened a blacksmith shop and started to try to make the world's best uh, pitons and climbing, climbing equipment, hard gear, because there wasn't a, a great solution. And he had a little shed, tin shed, as he called it, and, and was hand forging and using a power hammer, actually, too, to make these pitons and sell them. And you know, that's something I can really relate to. But more importantly, you know, I can relate to this, that set of values that he has, which is really the idea that we need to make less and whatever we make should be high quality and long lasting to better offset its social and environmental price. Goods should be well made and durable and easily repaired. Uh, whatever comes to the end of its life needs to be recycled or repurposed into something new. And that's one of the great things. I think almost every blacksmith would share a similar uh, value to that. Steel is incredibly recyclable. It gets used over and over. We take one form and turn it into something else. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it, although steel itself, and when it's manufactured newly, has a high carbon footprint and is, is not one of the cleanest technologies, the way that we can keep working with it and keep using it without, without, re, uh, uh, without, without sending it back to a foundry to be reworked is something great. And with the tools that I make and historic tools, tools you might find in a barn or a garage, great things, you will find 
that they can be repaired. So if you find a good heavy duty old tool head that's rusty and maybe it's got a broken handle, if you like the idea of using it, grab it, take it, buy it for a dollar, buy it for $5, save it, don't throw it out. You can bring it to somebody like me. I certainly restore and repair tools. I rehandle tools. I bring them back to life. And I, I don't care if I made the tool or it's out there. Uh, somebody else made it. I want to prevent things from getting into landfills. Uh, I think it's a great thing. And I get a lot of satisfaction out of seeing different ways that tools have been made over the years. So um, it's typically, you know, a little bit cheaper than buying the same tool new. Sometimes not, uh, but it is a good method. Somebody like me will tell you, I personally will tell you if you bring me a tool that shouldn't be repaired because it's just not a good enough quality um, or it's been too damaged. I'll tell you that before you spend any money on it. Um, most of the time I see lots of tools. I see a lot, of, especially a lot of heavy duty tools that are great. One area, one tool that doesn't work well for, for uh, fixing today though, are these beautiful old forged shovels that had what was called, I guess, uh, sort of like an aimed bend or a Seymour bend. And they have a really sharp, S curve bend in them. We just don't bend handles anymore that way. Uh, I suppose it became too costly to do, um, and no longer nobody has the presses uh, and the steam rooms to do that anymore. So that's the one exception. Although they are fantastic tool heads, and you could still use them for many more years, it can be really hard to replace a handle. So if you find one of those, do double check the handle first. Don't just assume we'll find a new handle. Um, let's see. So. This is just to start to give you an idea of, of the variety of tools that, that exist and that, that can exist. It's a small variety, but there I think we have, you know, nine, 10 different trowels and a bunch on the right and a bunch of weeders on the left. Um, my goal, much like Yvonne Chouinard when he started Patagonia there was, is to make the best, the best tools in the world, the most durable, long lasting tools that you can get. There are trade-offs. There are certain tools that will perform differently than my tools, the tools I make and the, tool, the tools that Bob started making uh, over 30 years ago. But many of our customers would agree and I enjoy it. Um, I enjoy the tools. I know the tools. And one of the things that I particularly love about hand making old historic tools is that they were made at a time when people did a lot more work by hand. So not only do they have the craftsman's knowledge in it, but they have the knowledge of the person who needed to do the work. Um, it's a really fun, fun experience. Give me a second while I move this over so I can make sure I see the right thing. Okay. This is a little graph that's going to maybe blow your mind. What blows my mind when I think about it, that it was 2.6 million years ago that we have identified the first sort of hammer stones and sharp flakes that appeared to be made intentionally by hominins, you know, our sort of uh, ancestors in, in evolution. It's amazing to think that we started problem solving back then. But it's also amazing to think that how slowly our adoption of tools went until roughly, you know, really it was until the industrial revolution. You can see, according to this, that we sort of move um, from this really primitive prehistoric stuff into a stone age where you start to see stone axe like tools and cutting tools. They're still extremely primitive, mostly rocks with flakes off of them, a little bit more developed perhaps, but that was about 1.7 million years ago. You have um, you know, around you have around 800,000 years ago is the time we know of the oldest uh, organic tools, like the oldest wooden tools. We probably were using sticks and other things like tools before then, but uh, it's hard for those things to stick around uh, that long. Around 400,000 years ago is when we have we see like the oldest wooden spears and those that have been found in Germany at this point. Around 200,000 years ago, you see we moved into awls and scrapers and more pointed tools. Um, and then, you know, recently ar archaeologists have dated um, tools used for like preparing leather and pelts for clothing, they assume, that are about 90,000 to 120,000 years ago. And that's kind of, we're starting to move into really intentional tools, a little bit more advanced technology, even though it's very, it's still very simple, um, simple overall. Um, we have, you know, here's like an interesting little fact that that tied to that thing of this seeing these tools that are about 90 to 120,000 years old, which is that scientists I read believe that we started wearing clothes or human, our human ancestors in that line started wearing clothes or things like clothing about 190,000 years ago. And they did it from studying lice. That's where they've drawn the conclusion. It's amazing. Around 20,000 years ago, we see um, first some weaving. And by the 7,000 to 9,000 years ago, we start to see the very beginning of sickles and, and the most simple agricultural tools you could find in the area around Iran and in what became um, in Egypt. And then we kind of move 
into the beginning of, of what we would call tools that we start to recognize. I'm gonna change this. So here's an example on the left there. That's one of an early sickle. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's a reproduction. I don't know for sure. Um, it came from a museum website, but that was based on a 7,000, 7,000 BC is, a, is when they sort of date that stone and bone tool. In the middle, we see a bunch of Roman tools that the British that Museum of London has um, from you know around the the first couple of centuries of of uh, the Common Era. And when I look at these tools in particular, I recognize tools that I make today and that I use today. I I make a tool just like that sort of cultivating trowel or cultivating pick tool on the right. I make a two tine cultivator just like that uh, on a long handle. Mine has a little bit more curve these days. Um, we still see pickaxes and adzes like those. We see little cutting sickles. It just is astounding to me that um, that that these tools made this way uh, resemble so much what I make today, um, still make today. Um, and then on the right, we start to see one of the pages of an example of the beginnings of agricultural tools as they captured in the first encyclopedia, Diderot. Um, he didn't write the whole encyclopedia, but it's often known as Diderot's encyclopedia. And I'm gonna go through a couple slides here, just showing some of the variety of, of pages. What's so fascinating, and I didn't know this until I started studying about tool history, was that part of Diderot's plan was to, their plan was to document artisan and craft work so that it could be, this, the encyclopedia could be a technical manual for craftspeople, as well as for farmers and for, for people. Although it's heavily, heavily illustrated. So a lot of these things, uh, what you would not have read uh, the details on. Um, it's really neat when I see there's a sickle in there, there's some hay hooks, there's scythes, forks, rakes, another two-time cultivator. Here, this, this slide shows so many uh, basic variations on, on weeding tools and um, different weeders that, you can, that you'll see some, something similar to in a modern tool today in a couple slides down. It's really interesting that following the French Revolution, you know, this idea that, that crafts people as, as real people Sorry, I kicked out uh, my uh, battery here. Crafts people were to be elevated and the, these, this information was, began to be valued for the first time in France in particular. Diderot's father happened to be a cutlery maker um, and Diderot saw, happened to see the crafts as equivalent to the fine arts or almost. Um, the encyclopedia was the first description of many trades. I make a spade very similar to the one that you see right up there. This isn't quite it, but it will give you a, a quick idea. It's not so different from, from what we see in the picture right there. Also, as a note, I'm gonna tell you a little story about wheelbarrows in a second. So down in the right, there is an example of a wheelbarrow from, from, uh, that, from that time. This is an example of just some old, old, uh, old French tools. And, um, you know, the forge tools, the centerpiece, the round one, is a type of eye hoe. We still make those. I just showed you a, a spade. There's a spade in there. There's a scythe in there. Uh, interestingly, we still see a wooden version of a tool, and it looks like it was reinforced. I can't tell if it's a wood, reinforced with wood or with steel, that cross beam. But a lot of rakes and a lot of things like that were made from wood. In fact, a lot of shovels were made from wood and then just tipped the edges with metal um, early on. This is not an example to me when I see this history, uh, it's from World War I and it's American Red Cross, just showing the importance of these agricultural tools to, to the history of the world. And to think that, um, that prosthetics in that early stage would be made and that somebody would be using them to work in the fields and work with a, a large forged fork like that is, uh, I think it's inspiring and you know sad both. Um, oops, sorry. Didn't uh, do that very well. Give me one second. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. This is a picture from my mentor Bob's barn of a bunch of tools that he collected over the years, and we've got a we've got a few of them. But the point here is just there's just such a wide variety of tools. Um, there's so many different shapes. It's endless discovery. They're all variations on the same thing, which is you know very similar to what I think of when I think of blacksmithing and making tools. We're often taking a shank, taking a blade. Uh, making a blade, making a shank, putting it on a handle, and then using it to slice, to cut, to chop, to do things. I, but yet there's still endless variations of the, of the tools. And well, often they're regional, often it's for very specific work. 
and sometimes it's just the uh, the design of the of the local maker. Here's an exa good example of just you know a bunch of rakes on the right and a bunch of um, spades and cultivating tools. Initially, until around the 1950s, actually or late 40s, I guess uh, late 40s, right after World War II, is when we really sort of committed to uh, not having such a variety of tools available anymore. There still are a lot of tools available, um, but there used to be many, many more in large part because you'd have a little store, there was lots of need of work. And um, there was a sort of recognition and study that, that you needed different sizes of tools for different type of work. One of the more interesting thing for shovels incidentally is that especially during the Victoria, Victorian era, they started to collect data. They wanted to make decisions with data. So they started to collect time studies and try and understand um, how much work, uh, usually a man, uh, manual work could do before he got totally worked out and uh, burnt out and couldn't, couldn't come back to work all six days of the week if he, that's what he was working. And from that, uh, there was the railroads especially kind of started to iterate and see, well, if you're lifting rocks, you can only lift so much. If you're lifting hay, you can lift a lot more. And so that's why we saw, see shovels down to like triple lot, like really small shovels and used to have really large shovels. Uh, no longer do we have such variety. There tends to be like a number two shovel. That's the most, that's the shovel you'll see most often. Um, and a lot of that was just sort of the outcome of post-World War II, kind of uh, the factories and the steel had been requisitioned for so long um, that a lot of the variety had, had been forced to leave the marketplace. And the companies realized that you could, you know, we didn't need all of those or not as many people needed all those. Of course, we also had mass migration to cities, which meant that there was a lot less need for these hand tools. When we did that, we also lost a lot of the knowledge though, as people moved to cities, especially in the in United States, we lost the knowledge to do things like we don't, most people today don't realize that a shovel should be sharpened. A trowel should be sharpened because you buy it at the store and it's typically not sharpened. I just bought some forged uh, heads from Seymour, which is uh, one of the large companies for an IHO. And I look at them and I was showing my assistant, they come in the entire front edge is a dull rectangle. I always sharpen them. I do sell those tools because that's not a tool that I want to make very often. Um, I will do it custom, but you get a great value by, by buying one of these. So I have to go ahead and I have to sharpen it down because they just don't even bother to sharpen it. And I know that most people uh, who buy those tools, they don't buy them from me, have no idea that they should be sharpened. It's a bit of lost knowledge, just like you know many other things that we've lost over the years. This is a, just a neat picture that I show because that big, really long shovel, that handle's probably 12 to 14 feet long. And it was uh, originally used to, to reach into stalls and scoop out manure. I think it's pretty neat. You can also see some early uh, versions of little secateurs and hand pruners in there. And then here's, oops, sorry. Okay. And then here's an example of, of uh, recently made tools, tools that I've made. There's a two tine uh, cultivator right there. You don't see it from the side. There's a half moon hoe, uh, split tine cultivator, variety of other hoes and a, and a berry hook. Uh, it's really fun. I see these tools, mine, the tools that other people have made over the years as being uh, essentially functional products, but I don't see any reason to lose the art in doing it. And I view them as aesthetic tools um, as well. And in particular, when we talk a little bit later about specifics of quality tools, we'll talk about these different formats of connecting a tool head into the handle. And in this case, you're seeing everything that's kind of gray or silver as a forged socket and everything that's red is a tang and ferrule. Uh, tang and ferrule is most widely used today. Um, and it, it has been over the years. Now, here's a couple uh, other tools. One of the really interesting things when you're looking at quality tools is it can be a little difficult to understand the, the era, to know the era. It's a little bit of a detective work and it's a lot of fun for that reason. In this case, the ads, which is up in the upper, my upper left, I hope it comes out that way for you. It's, the, it's got the dark wooden handle and it's kind of a curved heavy duty flat blade. You see the handle sticking at the top of it. And that's called an eye socket or an eye handle. That's a fairly modern tool. To the in the center, the big tool is a, what we call a daisy rake. It's you know used for raking and scraping out small, uh, small little, usually little lawn daisies, which are common in England, or they might be little violets or any variety of things. And those little square nuts on there give us a bit of a clue about when it was made and how it was made. And it was probably you know around mid century. Uh, give or take a decade or so, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell. To the right, you can't see that, but it's a really, it's got the very thin, bright, curved head. Um, that's actually a little two-inch hoe, two-inch wide hoe. That's one that I've made. 
doesn't look a whole lot different from the others. And then the one on the right is is a I wouldn't call it a half moon type of weeding hoe. It's it's a but it's a crescent of some type. And the way it was connected to the blade was really interesting. This was a tool that a customer brought me in that shape and asked me to refurbish for them and and restore. So it's an, essentially a modern tool, but it's quite interesting in the way it looks. And that's one of the other things I love about tools. Every tool has a story and a history. And if you look deep enough or you spend the time with it, you can discover not only how to use it or what it's used for, but, um, but, but, but you see, you learn a little something about the maker or the person who first acquired it. Um, I love, I love seeing strange, interesting tools. If you ever have any, please email me or uh, share them with us on Instagram. I love to see them. Um, they're really neat. With that in mind, last little section here before we go into some specific details that are more takeaways for you with your garden tools and, and uh, how we do it. I wanna tell a little bit about wheelbarrows because wheelbarrows are one of those things that we sort of probably think of mostly as just something out there, not particularly exciting, but in fact, they do have an exciting and interesting history. On the left, you can see a Chinese wheelbarrow. That's not, a, that's not one from 200 AD, but that essential style, which is a very large central wheel with um, the capacity to hold hold um, matter on the top and on the sides is, is the traditional Chinese style wheelbarrow. In the center, you see a whole variety of, of European style wheelbarrows and on the right is a modern version of a traditional European style. One of the things you notice is how is there's a variety of different ways of carrying and holding and pushing and pulling these things, but Chinese wheelbarrows we, we know that there are, that it was around, up to around, I wanna say around 2000 years ago that we know we first started using wheels in, in some way or another. Um, I think, you know, I think it's around 2000 BC and whether it's a two, two wheel cart or a four wheel cart, but those were pulled by animals traditionally. Um, we moved over time away from that, the Roman era, in, in Europe, they built amazing roads. And so these carts pulled by animals could transport goods and people and weapons and food um, all over Europe pretty efficiently. As the Roman era declined, uh, the roads became worse and worse and Europeans became much more insular, which is one of the reasons why we have such a fragmented, the history of still fragmented uh, Europe. It wasn't until around the 1200s that we know that wheelbarrows, human pushed one or two wheel um, barrels for doing work were, were becoming widely used and documented. That's a thousand years after we know that they were being used in China. It's amazing. There's this thousand year sort of gap. By the 1300s, wheelbarrows were being used in England uh, and Holland, but it wasn't until almost 1700, for example, that they were introduced to, into, into uh, Russia. And the story of that is pretty interesting because it was... Um, it was in January of 1698 when Peter the Great, as a young man, he was 25 at the time, the future czar, uh, was traveling through Europe trying to understand and learn about modernization and what was going on. I know he worked in shipyards. Um, he was just trying to absorb everything he could because he believed that Russia had had a great future. Uh, or you know, And um, he was planning to see what the best of the knowledge was. When he was in England, uh, he was given a house, rented a house. Uh, the equivalent of renting a house. He was given a house to live in, I should say, that had one of the best gardens in Europe. It had been um, worked on for 45 years. It was well known as being an amazing representation of, of uh, what you could do. And the name of the garden is Seas Gardens, if you ever want to look that up. It's interesting. They were supposedly had a huge holly, um, holly hedge that was 400 feet long and nine feet high and five feet thick. And this was kind of like one of the most amazing things. Well, Peter the Great saw a wheelbarrow and his entourage, and they had never seen the wheelbarrow before and decided it would be a fantastic time to have races. So just like these pictures in the center here show kids being pushed, there were men with kids and or women and, and, and other men in the wheelbarrows drinking and they were running through the garden. They were known to essentially destroy many of these wonderfully planted, planted rows, but they also decided that uh, one of the challenges of manliness would be to see if anybody could push a wheelbarrow with a person through these uh, amazing holly hedges. I can't imagine who would want to be in the wheelbarrow, but uh, I assume can only assume there's lots of alcohol involved and uh, macho uh, activity. Inside this uh, chalet or, or uh, mansion that they were living in at the time when they left, there were bullet holes found in the windows, in the, uh, in the windows and in paintings. There sounds like a, seemed like it was a real animal house type of experience at the time. Um, but having said that, 
around 1891. So, you know, a little less than 200 years later, you see the crown prince and future czar Nicholas um, of Russia loading a wheelbarrow. There's a picture of this, of him loading a wheelbarrow with dirt and moving it and dumping it ceremonially to begin the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. So might have been a, a, a fun toy, a fun, uh, perhaps wild experience, but it, it began to make its impact. Before we get into the, the nuts and bolts here, which will be a shorter section of what I'm going to talk about, I like to bring up this picture. I think this is, I didn't make any of these tools except for the widger, which is the tool on the top. Um, but again, it's just a reminder to me that, that tools are functional, but they can be exceptionally beautiful and sculptural. Um, we like to, I'll tell you the quick thing about these tools, their names and what they are, because I bet, I bet some of you know some of them, but not all of you know all of them. Um, on the left, that wooden tool, which is really just a scraper. And I have another one back here. You can bring it up real quick. Just a simple little scraper for knocking mud off your boots or your tools, scraping mud off. And that's called a man. And I'm going to tell you the explanation that Bob gave me when I asked him why that's called a man. And he said it's because when men pick it up, they say it does all the dirty work and gets none of the thanks. When women look at it and pick up it, they say, um, they say most of the time this just sits around and doesn't do very much and my and then i'll add in this which is my sister would just tell me that in today's world it could be both everything anything or nothing it is a great tool i use it i scrape my tools off rather than you know clean them off with a brush or anything else like that i find it pretty effective you don't need a special tool for it any piece of little wooden scraper will work a plastic scraper you can use your boots you can use metal whatever but but I recommend a, a scraper in your, in your uh, tool care kit if you've got one, set it, set it right inside. The middle tool there uh, with the steel tip is a type of dibble or dibbler or dibber, depending on your preference. In the top, that little, that little silver trowel is a, is a widger, which is a, an English style transplanting trowel. I make them, I sell them mostly for um, house plants and also for little transplants. And then we have a fruit snip. Um, so apple for picking apples. Next, we'll move right on in here into sort of garden tool anatomy and the basic parts of almost any tool. There are some exceptions here, and we're not talking too much about pruners or secateurs here, but uh, you know, let the most of the hand of the other hand tools that we'll have shovels, spades, most hoes, things like this. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why they matter. So we have the head and we have the shank or the shaft. Those are both critical pieces and those help you identify the meaning of the tool, what it's for, why you might use it. We have the way it connects to a handle, which is typically either a solid socket, the tang and the ferrule, a strap socket, or an eye socket. And then we have the handle or the helve. And we go in here to this picture, and you'll sort of see uh, see some tools here. On the left, the heavy duty ones, those are two, I make them, they're he these are all tools I made, heavy duty hand hose. And the far left tool is the tool where I draw out a single bar of metal um, from about two inches wide and three eighths inch thick down to being around three eighths inches thick by maybe a quarter inch thick. And that goes in a hole drilled in the handle. Um, and that little red thing is called the ferrule. And most modern tools, you'll stick some epoxy in there, shove the head in, and that's all she wrote. I do drill through the tool uh, shank or tang itself and the ferrule all the way through and a hand hammer a rivet in there to create a mechanical connection. Um, so that's one, one style of connection. To the right, we have a forged uh, single piece solid socket. So that all just started out as a single flat bar. Um, it, it's, and I do what's called fullering it to kind of make a little narrow neck where I want to separate those two things. And then I flatten it out and wrap it around uh, to make the socket that goes over a solid handle. And then I finish the top in the same way. Uh, next, we just have a lighter weight version of a, of a tang and ferrule style hoe. And then these two on the right are forged solid sockets, but they're welded. Again, I, I gas weld them. So in this case, I'll make that, that, that curved gooseneck shank and I will separately forge a cone. And then I will stick the neck or the, uh, the, what would be the tang inside the cone and, and hammer it down, weld it. And then I set it on, uh, on, a, um, on a, a solid, a solid uh, handle. There's a lot of reasons why you might like one or the others of those. Typically, people will say a forged socket or a solid socket is the best or the strongest. Uh, it, in, it is the most durable in many ways. Uh, it's also the heaviest. So there are great reasons to choose a tang and ferrule tool. 
um, especially if you want something that's light and that's durable. If you're not going to use the tool a lot, uh, tang and ferrule is more than is going to be enough in most cases. Um, if it's something you're going to use every day and you want a little weight because you don't want to use your arms to press down a solid socket or a forged, uh, a forged, so forged socket are, are definitely great options. Here's just an example of a few, uh, again, a few varieties, but what we see here in these, in these spades are the strapped version. So we have the three, four bigger spades there and different shapes are all strapped. And that means there's a piece of metal going down the front and a piece of metal going down the back and a rivet between them, the, the handles kind of sandwiched between them. We also have another solid socket and a uh, tang and ferrule there on those rakes and the four tine cultivators. Again, I like to say there's some art to these. So uh, for me, they're beautiful tools. They're rustic. They're not meant to look like they came out of a machine. They're just meant to do really good work and last for a long time. And this last picture gives us just a quick example of, again, you can sort of see what, is, what the solid socket looks like on the left there, how a handle, a solid handle would fit right in there, uh, and then you rivet it on. Um, but second from the right, the big black kind of square head with, our, with rounded corners, that's an eye socket and an eye hoe. And that's, that tool right there, that eye hoe or peasant hoe is still the most widely used tool in the world for um, breaking new ground where machinery doesn't go. Uh, they're great tools. The, that particular one um, that I saw was an old one forged in England. I have still have a bunch of those left. Um, I clean them up, I sharpen them, and I sell them until they run out. Um, but they're great tools. I, I use it to break up the garden early in the year, much like I might use a spade. And then later in the year, if I want to weed large areas, um, I'll use it. That particular one is about six inches wide. I also um, sell the ones I mentioned earlier from Seymour that are seven and three quarters inches. All right, so we're gonna move on. And one of the things we have here is we have the five, uh, five S's, let's call them to consider when you're choosing a tool to do some work um, specifically. So this is when you're looking at your, in your garage or your garden shed and saying, which one do I need or what should I do? And you're thinking about the, the work. So the first S is for selection. What work do you need to do? So don't take a really thin, tiny, lightweight hoe out if you need to be uh, chopping and digging and digging a new bed. It's not the right tool for the work. Uh, it's going to make you miserable. You'll probably damage the tool and you'll certainly get frustrated. The next S is strength. Like how strong are you and how heavy is it? That goes back a little bit to, uh, to what I was talking about with those other hoes in that picture, uh, those a couple pictures back, but it also goes to talking to so many gardeners at garden shows. Even my hand tools have always been extra heavy. Um, you know, we do it Bob started it, he really believed any tool that could be broken accidentally doing the regular work was a problem. And I, I share that belief, but I also hear the, what people tell me um, when, and it's often, it is often uh, smaller, women on the smaller side who tell me the tools are just too heavy. They'd love to buy one, they'd love to use one, but they just can't see themselves working with a tool that's so, that's so heavy. And that's a great thing to understand. You do not want a tool that is too heavy for you to work with comfortably. It's not safe, you could hurt yourself, you could strain a muscle, you could also cut yourself, any number of other things, but more importantly, you're not gonna have fun doing the work um, as far as I'm concerned. And if you're not gonna have fun, you're making the work worse. And although we all love being in our gardens and working, there is this element of um, wanting to do work in a way that is, if not easy, uh, certainly do the work in a way that is enjoyable unless it be a pastime as well as a passion for most of us. The third S is for specificity. Do you need a tool that's going to do one thing, like dig a hole, or do you need something that's going to do a lot of things adequately? So one example I give, I have a little tiny rockery trowel that I use a lot. Let's see if I have one. It's just a really thin trowel, something like this. I don't know if you can see me in your little screen there talking. I use this tool almost exclusively. It wouldn't be great for digging the big hole. It's not good for if I need to break up clumps of dirt. I'm not going to be swinging it. But I do often hold it in the middle, just like this with my thumb in there, so you can see, and I'll weed with it, I'll dig with it, I'll plant with it, I'll scrape things out with it, I'll do all sorts of things. So this isn't maybe the best tool for any one thing, unless you're working in a rock wall, or in zero scape spaces, or perhaps with lots of succulents, but it is a great tool because it can do lots of different things. And I find that to be ex exceedingly useful when I do it. The next thing to think about is, is it sharp and can you sharpen and maintain the tool? There's no point in getting a really nice tool that will require sharpening or maintenance if it, that's not something you're willing to do. Good news is it's really easy to sharpen a tool. All you need is a file. I mean, you can, of course, 
take it to your local farmer's market or bring it to me and we're happy to sharpen things. But uh, all the tools I make, uh, you can use a mill bastard file. This is a small version of it. It's just a simple little file. And all you're gonna do to sharpen it is run it along the edge, just like that, and hone it more like a knife than letting it get full, fully dull. You don't wanna use a, knife, uh, a mill bastard file like that on your pruners or something like that. Those require either a stone or a little bit more control. So don't, uh, don't do that. But on most of your bigger shovels and hand tools, uh, 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 mill bastard file is gonna be more than adequate to keep it sharp. And then the last thing is where will you store it when it's not in use? I've been making a lot of smaller tools that'll fit in a drawer because I know not everybody has a garden shed or a garage anymore. And especially, I talk to lots of customers who tell me they've, they're in the process of downsizing and moving into perhaps an apartment or moving into a condo and they're gonna start doing container gardening or house plants. Uh, in that case, there's no point in buying and having a huge shovel around that you're never gonna be able to use. You want one or two small tools that you can do the work with. And this is just a picture of a variety of different weeders that kind of reinforces this notion that you can, depending on the work you're going to do, there is a, there's a tool for that. Uh, some of these are very specialized, like the one in the middle, the leverage weeder, which has the curve in it. I wish I could point to it. I can't, but something like the asparagus knife, which is just the right, is much more versatile for digging dandelions, but you can also do some basic cutting with it. And then of course, the top is on the left is a diamond hoe. Uh, people love that as a scuffle hoe, and on the top right is a homey, which is a 2,000-year-old tool designed from Korea that is one of those multi-purpose tools that can do lots of things really well. Um, I, it's particularly fun. Um, here's just a, another quick look when you're choosing your shovel, choosing the right tool. These are actually both spades, not shovels, but you can see from the picture on the left, one is almost perfectly straight in line with the handle, uh, and then the other one, it has a slight bit of lift to it. The one on the left, uh, with the lift, with this lift or the angle is really much more useful if you need to dig a hole and move some of the dirt out of it. Uh, the other spades are going to be a lot better for breaking up soil and working in pre-established beds and kind of preparing things. Um, so again, you, it would be extremely difficult to dig a hole and lift things out with a totally flat spade. So knowing the tool that you're going to choosing the right tool for the work is is important. We're into the home stretch here. Just a couple more minutes, and then uh, if there's questions, um, we'll get to those. Um, but five useful things to, to know about using your tools. And, you know, these all kind of relate to ergonomics and strength and, and simple work. First thing, you've all heard it, we've all done it, which is dig. If you're digging, dig with your legs, not with your back. That'll save you an immense amount of uh, pain in the long run. But it also lets you work for quite a bit uh, uh, longer at one time and then lets you move on to the next task. And what that simply means is the correct way of doing it. I really am going to have a hard time demonstrating it in here. but if I can, the rough idea is just, you can sort of get the idea, instead of bending over like this and working like this, I'm exaggerating, you want to, with a shovel, you want to bend, lift, stand straight up, and then toss your dirt to the side. A second one, take small bites and give yourself room. What that really means is, you know, we're tempted to get work done faster sometimes by taking big shovel scoops. I just moved, I don't know, a dump truck full of gravel to the back. We're redoing our fence and I needed to do a line of gravel along the fence. And um, it was really tempting to take the biggest shovel we could find and do the most. But I'll tell you, after about two hours of shoveling from the front of the house and putting in a wheelbarrow and running it to the back, uh, I was very happy that I had controlled myself and taken a small shovel where I could easily just keep lifting. And that's true if you're digging a new bed, it's true if you're uh, weeding, uh, it's true if you're removing blackberries, whatever it might be, give yourself a small little area to work in. Don't try and do it all on a single thing. Take, take small bites is, is, is how I talk about that. And then also give yourself the room so that you're not, try, you're not uh, twisting your body in a weird position. Um, number three, hoe and weed to the side. Now, this is the hardest thing for people to remember because most of us have never done it, but most, let's see. I'll just grab this one. This is a, this tool is just an example. It's the hoe me that um, I mentioned, but I, instead of being on a short handle, it's a long handle, the 2000 year old Korean design. Most of the time when I give somebody a garden, a tool, and I ask them to show me how they use it, they take it they, put it, they put it in front of them and they lean over and they start working this way. Well, I ask them to change the position of their thumbs. I tell them, please hold it like a broom and work off to your side. And then you can keep a straight lower back you do less work and you can work for a very long time, very comfortably. 
just working off to your side, just like you can use a broom. So, and if you haven't used a broom, uh, you are a lucky person with a spouse who probably is going crazy. Uh, number four, keep tools sharp and clean. You know, that's simple. Uh, that's good for most things, but for any digging tool, any, any weeding tool, it's tempting to just let it go and it'll get dull and you do that. But if it's sharp and it's clean, it'll do the work fast. It'll make it easier. And uh, if you sharpen and or clean it at the end of work, it'll be ready for you next time. So you don't have to start with that process. Last thing is choose the right tool for the right job. We kind of already talked about that on the previous, in the previous batch, but it is important and I, can't, I have to reiterate it. Uh, use, don't, don't take a trowel and then start to use it like a pry bar. Don't use a diamond hoe, which has a, a weight or a hoe that has a very thin blade and try to remove a large old sword fern with it. Use the right tool at the right time because you'll damage the tool. You'll probably damage your plant and you'll probably hurt yourself if you don't. Uh, a couple little bonus tips when using an extendable tree pruning saw, don't look up the whole time. You look up to spot it, you set it in the, at the tree limb and the crink and then start the, start the cut and then just look straight ahead or look down. You don't need to see what you're doing. It should be in there um, and that'll save you strain. It will also uh, protect you over wall. And then finally with hand pruners, which most of us do a fair amount of hand pruning uh, using any number of, of sizes or variety of pruners, uh, don't cut anything bigger than your pinky with them. They're really not meant for that. Uh, if you have ratcheting ones, maybe you can stretch it a little bit, but you'll save your hands and you'll save uh, the pruners overall if you if you limit yourself to pinky size. And if you, you know, after all these years, I have a bit bigger of a pinky from, you know, the hammering and the squeezing of tongs. It used to be a lot smaller. If you have a pinky that's half the size of mine, uh, you can only cut half the size uh, branch as I can cut, even if we're using exactly the same pruners. Let's see. And this is just an example too, when we choose the right size for the right thing. These are pruners I don't make. These are ARS. They're Japanese pruners that I sell. The one on the right is a, is a forged and a Japanese style spring, uh, but the, it's a very large one. So depending on the size of your hand, it's going to help you determine the size of pruner you even want to use. And to the left, those are little fruit snips, but you can use those quite often, especially if you have small hands, smaller hands. And I like to wrap up with that picture, which is just, again, where reiterate this idea that, that tools can be art, they can be functional, they can give a lot of joy and meaning, and they all have a story behind them. And I hope you've learned something and enjoyed something here. And if you have any questions, uh, you can, at any time after this, you can email me. Uh, there's my email, uh, there's the phone number and uh, the website, and I'm happy to do that. And if we have questions for now, please let me know. And I guess I have to open the chat box. Let me see. Um, I can read them to you. Okay, that'd um, be great. There's a question asking the difference between a spade and a shovel. Well, typically a spade is going to be used more for, for digging, but not digging holes so much. It's, so it typically will have, this is a, an example of a spade, and I'll show you a couple of features that I'll identify as a spade. For one, when we look at it, it's got a fairly flat blade. They can come in all different sizes and shapes. I guess I don't have any other shapes out here exactly. Um, I make a rabbiting spade, which is big and round. I make an Irish spade, a German style spade. Um, but one of the real things you're seeing is there's not a lot of lift. This is a straight handle. It goes straight into the, into the tool head and it is gonna be used for small digging for working out, but you're not transferring um, things with it. If you need to dig a hole to plant a tree, you're probably not gonna use a spade. You're more likely to use the spade to break up the soil first and then use a shovel. And of course, shovels come in any number of varieties and shapes, but they're almost always going to have more lift like this. This is just one from my backyard. They're going to have be more cupped. They're kind of a more intermediary type tool. This is a type of it's called a capra. It's a little bit closer to a hybrid between a shovel and a spade uh, used often in irrigation and things like that. Um, so those are your key key things. If you're digging new beds and you want to turn things over and move them around, you shovel, that's, you'll probably get it at Home Depot. I mean, I make them, but it's just really not worth it for most people. There are some good shovels out there. I can help you find a good sho uh, forge shovel if you need one, uh, even if I don't make it. Um, I make strap spades primarily, and uh, I like making tools that are not uh, as mass produced out there. Um, and I try to make only tools that I think I can make better than what's out there uh, in a similar version if I can, because um, I don't want you to just spend more money on a tool that's 
just more expensive because it's been made by hand by somebody. If, if there's a better tool out there, I'd rather direct you to that uh, to do it. So I hope that answers the question uh, enough. Thank you, yes. Um, there's a weeder that you show that has a little wooden ball at the top. Can you tell us what that's for? Yeah, I did not, let's see, there was one, I know there was a picture of it somewhere. I can't go back for those who, who, who wanna see it. I can't quite remember what slide it's on, but that ball is a form of creating leverage. And if I do go, I think if I go back uh, one or two pictures, I won't see that, but I can show you. Okay, oops, there we go. We got very close. Ah, there we go. No, let's try one. Too. There we go. Just like the, the weeder in the middle there that has the half round bend in it, that's also a fulcrum or a lever. So you take a tool like that and you push it straight down. The ball serves the same function. And that ball is actually an old Victorian era tool. Originally the ball, it's, a, it's just a wooden ball that's put about two and a half to three inches above where those forked teeth are. And, and um, I put a straight handle, solid hand, solid shank through the center of that and then into the handle. But the original tool was much smaller and more lightweight and uh, the ball and the handle were turned out of a single piece they're about six inches seven inches long total and they had two little tiny tiny prongs and you know part of their earlier time i believe is that you know generally speaking in, you know, english gardeners and english gardens have extremely well cultivated and amended soils in many cases and and uh for one reason or another english english gardeners tend to be more delicate and useful uh, gentle with their tools than we do. That's why you see a lot of smaller scale tools. You see tools that um, many Americans would be, you know, more likely to bend or break instantly because they'd be trying to use it for five different things. Uh, we're all fairly uh, uh, ingenious in our in our ability to think of how we might use a tool. Thanks. Um, next is what kind of wood is used for the handle? Uh, there, you can find tools all over the place with lots of different handles. My the tools I use. Uh, I make all of these, this style, which would be most of, almost all of my small hand tools, these brownish handles, those are all hickory. Uh, hickory is known, and hickory is kind of a striking tool handle in general. It's known to be extremely sturdy and strong. It has long enough fibers, so it doesn't uh, break easily. It holds together, but it's just quite resilient. And then on the longer handle tools, like um, all of these, something like this, and on the, and on the spades, uh, for example, those will all be made out of ash, which is again, a very strong, fairly light uh, tool and it's flexible. It has long fibers, so it can bend and flex, but it doesn't break. Um, you'll see tools made with maple handles, with cherry, with all sorts of other decorative uh, woods as well. But um, hickory is kind of a, hickory from the hand tools is kind of a historic option um, and it's extre extremely sturdy. And the one thing you can do with uh, my handles or with any of these tools, that, uh, any handle really, is uh, you can lightly sand them. You don't need to do that with the brown tool, the brown handle tools, the hand tools that I sell, but putting some boiled linseed oil on them or some other oil, you can use teak, Danish oil, whatever you have, just a, a type of drying oil um, over them will help fill in pores and make them last a lot longer than they will if you don't. Around here, especially because we go through those, you know, like this year, seemed like, I don't know if it was three months or four months where there's barely a drop of rain, air is extremely dry. Uh, now we're going, it's raining outside right now. I can hear it on my window, at least it is right here. And we go these fluctuations of moisture and that's, that is hard on wood. And as much as possible, you don't want moisture getting in and that you don't want the wood fibers expanding and contracting more than they naturally will. It's also why if you buy a table or see a tabletop out there or something, uh, you can always double check and a good quality tabletop will have be finished on both sides. Uh, if it's only finished on one side, the top or the bottom, it's going to crack eventually because it'll be contracting uh, on and expanding at a different different rate on the unfinished side versus the finished side. We'll just do one more, Seth. Um, do you have a recommendation for deadheading or pruning roses? Um, I do not have a great a great recommendation for that. I I I uh, I do both <laughs> during the during this time of the year during the summer. I'll go out there and I'll trim things off. And then usually I'd, I'd give it another, you know, for me, another, it's about another month or so, half month, something like that. And I'll cut it down about, I'll cut down my roses. I have a few rose bushes out here that have grown right now. They're probably 10 feet tall. Um, and I'll cut them down to being about five feet. And then in another month or so, I'll cut them down a little bit farther and, and I'll try and get them down to about a foot or two. But um, I do not have a great 
uh, a great knowledge in roses. So I'm sure the, that that um, there are better people to answer it to give you a knowledgeable answer on that. <laughs> I think the question was um, which tool as far which as tool. Okay. Yeah. In I'm that sorry. case, <laughs> that's okay. In that case, I mean, I do think it depends on the rose bush. I I would use a I would use some kind of hand printer. I would just make sure it's clean and it and it's sharp because because you want to uh, have clean cuts whenever you can. And you know, one thing that I do on pruners, if you brought pruners to me, I do maintain them. I'll typically take them apart, clean off. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of uh, gunk that will build up in there um, and everything. I'll check the springs. I'll check everything. And then I use uh, a gun oil actually a drop or two when I reassemble the tools. And that is a long lasting type of oil that will keep things lubricated, but also help keep uh, dirt out of there. And it's, they're made, you know, being made for guns. The, the brand I use is called Break Free. Uh, and it was originally made by the military for guns. So it's extremely, it's used to extremely harsh conditions. So perfect for what we're doing in our gardens. Well, and you actually just answered the last question that just came in. So good job on that. Oh, good. Um, I think as far as time, um, that's it for us. Great. Um, Janice was going to come back on and just give us a reminder about folks who want to order and what they need to think about. Exactly. So um, I just wanted to reiterate once again, if you weren't here at the very beginning when Kathy was telling us about the promotion code that Seth has offered our group, um, it's uh, for anyone who's in the Master Gardener Foundation as well as anyone attending this um presentation so it's mgfcc that stands for master gardener foundation clark county 21 and i did go ahead and enter a link into the chat box if you want to uh if you were to click that one it'd go straight to the website and it would automatically enter the code into your cart when you're ready to check out um seth did remind us that long handled tools you can't choose the free shipping option. Um, and even if you enter the code, it's gonna go ahead and add the shipping because it's a long handled tool. And so he said to overcome that, just give him a call and he will be able to make sure that that doesn't happen for your order. Or if it does happen for your order, he will gladly refund any shipping charge that is inadvertently added. So. He, what he's going to do is he's going to come across the river, across the Columbia, into Washington, and he's going to meet us at Heritage Farm on Saturday, October 30th at 10 a.m., and he's going to deliver any orders that are placed within the next week, and hopefully there will be enough time for him to prepare all of our orders. So I will do my best, and I would do my best even if something slipped in a day late, but, but try. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. So um thank you so much seth what a great presentation very 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 interesting so you have a great little setup there and yes. we appreciate you coming to uh speak with all of us well thank you yes. and, and let me let me point out one last thing which is that people customers and, and people call all the time they want to see some tools they want to see me make a tool how i'm making tools uh, i welcome people to come visit you just uh, give me a call or send me an email so that we can set up an appointment because I'd hate, especially for, for your group, uh, I'd hate for you to fight the traffic and get down here and then find that I'm taking my daughter to violin or out buying steel. So <laughs> if you call me, we'll, I'll make sure I'll, we'll, we'll arrange a time when uh, I'll be available. That's a great offer. And I know myself, I'm going to definitely take you up on that. Great. Thank you, Seth. The kudos are coming in and what a, what a great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you I do so want to just um, just want to let folks know that we have another talk coming up for the Master Gardener program, um, kind of one of the last few to round out the year. Backyard fruit trees with WSU Extension Clark County Master Gardener Karen Palmer. She's going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of growing your own tree fruit. That'll be Monday, October twenty fifth, from seven to eight thirty, and I've put a link in the chat box as well. So. Hope to see you then and good night and thanks everyone. Watch the website for uh, the recording. Thanks. Thanks, Seth. Thank you.